It's a great day here at the Waters Road Church of Christ, and we're delighted that you have chosen to be with us this morning. Before we get into our lesson, I want to remind everybody this morning about a special opportunity that we have here at Waters Road this morning. That is, immediately following the close of this service, we're going to be taking part in our visitors' luncheon. This is the third such event we've had here at Waters Road since I've been a part of this congregation and we have some good folks who have worked together to make this possible. And it's going to be right at the conclusion of today's services in Annex A. So what I would ask of our members here at Waters Road, make sure that you have sought out any visitors that we have this morning. And make sure they know that they are invited to be a part of our visitors luncheon. And visitors, listen, we're not going to make you do a song and dance. All you have to do is just come and eat and share a meal with us. And it's free. And it'll be a good time for us to get to know you a little bit better. Coming up after the sermon, after invitation, we're going to be recognizing a couple that have, have placed membership here recently and also two who were baptized into Christ this past week. So uh, good news there on that front we'll be talking about at the end uh, after our invitation has been given this morning. There was a young man who had been working on the railroad for a number of years. And he got tired of his current position and he decided he wanted to step down out of the train and get down on the tracks where the real work was taking place. He wanted to become a signalman for the railroad. For his interview, he was told to meet the inspector at the signal box. And the inspector asked him, he said, son, got a question for you. If we give you this job, what would you do in case you realize that there were two trains heading towards each other on the same track. And the young man answered him and said, Sir, that's easy. See, what I would do is I would go to the switch points and change those up for one of the trains. And the inspector then asked the young man, said, Well, what would you do if the lever broke? The young man said, Well, then I'd jump down out of the signal box and I'd go use the manual level lever, which is over there. Next, the inspector said, well, what if that lever had been struck by lightning? The young man said, well, I'd run to the next signal box. And I'd phone the next signal box to let them know what was happening. Then they could take care of business. The inspector continued on, what if the phone was busy? <laughs> The young man said, well, in that case, I would rush down out of the signal box and use the public emergency phone at the crossing right up there. Then the inspector said, what would you do if the public emergency phone had been vandalized? The young man said, well, then I would just run into town and get my uncle. <laughs> that answer puzzled the inspector. So he asked him, why, Pertel, would you go get your uncle? The young man answered, that's simple, sir. My uncle's never seen a train crash before. <laughs> now, as funny as that is, the honest truth that I wish to share with you right now, far too many Christians in the year 2019 Far too many of us feel that our life is headed toward a crash. There are way too many that I see on a daily basis that really and truly feel, Jonathan, my life is out of control. I never know what's going to happen day after tomorrow. I'm not sure. My life has to be headed toward a crash. And I want to share with you this morning, first and foremost, that there are four identifiable marks for personal experiences that we face that if we don't handle properly, the truth is our life will be headed for a crash. And the first one is this. Let's take and take the word crash here for a moment. It's going to be up on the screen. The number one thing that we have to begin with is that our lives are made up of a lot of chaos. A lot of chaos. And chaos distracts us. It sends Christians in a hundred different directions. And there's a lot of us that feel like our family life is nothing but chaos. 
Not enough hours in the day. Not enough days in the week. Instead of trying to keep up with a rat race society, good folks, take some time to calm down. Then you can start making some differences in the important areas of your life. But when you try to put out five fires in your life out at one time, you do nothing but spread chaos. The second is confusion. And that goes hand in hand with chaos, does it not? When we're confused about who we are or who it is that God has called us to be in our life, if we're confused about our very own purpose in life, then all we're going to do in life is merely survive. Thriving is out of the equation. It's time that a lot of us sit down and realize that when confusion reigns in our lives, we will be unproductive and ineffective. The third thing is conflict. Satan thrives on conflict. Satan thrives, and he's in constant conflict with our spiritual nature. And he tempts us to draw us away from the things that would cause us to thrive and tends to tell us to only live on those things that bring about mere survival. In fact, Satan throws up a lot of roadblocks. Every week, we're going to face obstacles that stand in our way of being the type of people that God has called us to be. Number four, constriction. How many of you in this room have ever heard of a boa constrictor? Raise your hand. I'm sure you all have. Now, when I was growing up, there was a book. And I'm not going to go over it this morning, the whole uh, writing. But many of you remember Silverstein. I believe it's Silverstein, right? I'm being swallowed up by a boa constrictor. Go back and read that sometime. But the point being, when a boa constrictor has you in his grasp, all he does is tighten up ever so more. And then he begins to swallow that prey. That's exactly what is happening in a lot of people's lives. They are being constricted by time, by the chaos, by the confusion, by the temptation, and they don't see a way out. It's walls closing in around many people this morning that cause them to feel like all they can do is simply survive. Thriving is out of the question. Let me say there are probably people in this room this morning that at some time or another, even maybe this morning, there are some of us that feel like that train inspector, that we know the equation. Eventually, there are going to be moments of emergency. Maybe even there are those who feel like their life is like those two trains heading towards one another. But let me ask you this morning, is there a way out? Is there a way to get your life back on track? If you feel like your life is nothing more than one day on track, the next day off track, is there a way to solidify your life? I want you to listen to me very carefully at this point because the truth is, yes, there is a way. Back in Mark chapter 10 from our scripture reading this morning, I believe Jesus gives us an example of a man who felt very similar to the way that we're talking about this morning. Maybe he felt like his life was simply nothing but a continual tragedy. But he had his life turned around by the power of Jesus Christ. And in the passage that we read, Jesus showed us how this man's life was miraculously changed when he encountered Jesus. And Jesus tells us this story today so that we can know our lives can be turned around if and only if we're willing to commit our lives fully to Jesus Christ. Now remember, coming to Jesus is only the beginning. Coming to Him is only beginning point, both in these verses 
and in our daily lives. Now the man in this story, he was named Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus was a man by any account who had very little going for him. The story tells us that Bartimaeus was stranded on the outskirts of Jericho. He had possibly spent most of his life living on those streets. And there didn't seem to be any changes on the way in his life. Nothing to really change the course of his nature. No way for him to break the cycle as it may be. In other words, he was simply decided upon, this is my life. But let's notice what caused Bartimaeus' issues. Mark tells us that Bartimaeus was blind. Now, I can't even begin to imagine for a moment what it would be like to be in that condition. I can't imagine not being able to see the beauty of the sunrise or to see the beauty of my children or any of the other ideas that come along with eyesight. Not being able to participate in those things. That was his life. And Mark leads us to believe that this had been his condition for a very long time. We know that he was poor. We know that he was blind. We know that he could not work. You might say that he was a pitiful soul. Bartimaeus' life, Bartimaeus's life felt helpless. He was a man who, by our lesson terms this morning, was simply surviving. No enjoyment, no happiness, no success, no peace, no joy. Bartimaeus' life was all about getting from one day to the next. That is, until Jesus passed by. Now what can we learn from Bartimaeus? What can we learn this morning that is going to help us take our life from here and simple survival to growing and thriving as a Christian? What can do that in our lives? Well, first of all, to move from simply surviving to thriving, we must learn to capitalize on the opportunities that God provides for us. Once Bartimaeus discovered that Jesus was passing by, once he figured out he was close to him, he shouts out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Now why? Why would this man cry out in this nature? Was he simply begging as he had always done? Is that all this was? How did he know of Jesus' miraculous powers? How did he even know that Jesus was coming? I don't know for sure, but it's obvious by the text that he knew that Jesus was about to pass by. Bartimaeus sensed that he had an opportunity. And he acted on that opportunity. Bartimaeus pleaded with Jesus. Bartimaeus capitalized on the opportunity that God had placed before him. Now, in Mark chapter 10, verse 17 through 31, I want you to take your Bibles now and look in another passage. The story about the rich young ruler. You see, the rich young ruler came to Jesus with several questions in his life. And Jesus presents him with an opportunity. An opportunity for his life to be turned around. But as we read from the text, Jesus told this rich young ruler... Go, sell everything you have and give it to the poor and then you'll have treasure in heaven and then come follow me. That was the opportunity. That was the opportunity. But tragically, this young man, instead of following Jesus, went away sorrowful. Now, why did that take place? Why would a person turn down an offer from Jesus Christ? In this case... The rich young ruler cared more for his possessions. They were more of a priority for him than the opportunity in which Jesus had set before him. Today, every one of us in this room have a door of opportunity. Are you not a Christian this morning? Then this morning is your opportunity to become a Christian. Are you a wayward Christian? Have you walked away from God? Then right now is the opportunity to take that sin out of your life. No longer walk in that darkness. 
but come today and turn your life around. Are you not involved in a ministry here at Waters Road? There's plenty of opportunities. Today is the day. Choose and decide to get involved. The door of opportunity is wide open for us to get up off of the pew and start getting to work and serving God. But the choice is ours. Thriving in today's work. Thriving in life requires taking those first steps out in courage. You have to be willing. Sometimes when the water seems murky and when things seem a little bit dark and dreary, many times it takes that first step of courage to begin to walk on water in your life. To change where you're at and to give yourself a new destination. No longer simply surviving, but growing to a life of thriving. Now secondly, to move from surviving to thriving, we must learn to minimize the negative voices that are constantly around us and will try to rob us of our dream. Now in this story back here with Bartimaeus, he cries out for help. We heard what he said Many there, though, afterwards began to tell him, Hush! Be quiet! You see, that crowd had stereotyped this man. They saw him every day in the streets. They saw what was going on. This was nothing more in their minds than a blind beggar. And in their eyes, he would never be anything but that individual. That's what they figured him to be, that he was then, and that's what he was always going to be. So why would this Jewish rabbi, this master teacher, why would this person named Jesus take time out of his day to want to help such an outcast? <laughs> You know, the thing I appreciate most about this story is Bartimaeus' reaction. Do you notice what he did when the crowd tried to rob him of his dream? He shouted even louder, didn't he? Same thing. Shouted even louder. Son of David, have mercy on me. You see, Bartimaeus was not going to let a bunch of negative, critical, heckling bystanders Rob him of his dream of what? See. There's a similar story told in the Old Testament. 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're told how David had to overcome the negative voices. 1 Samuel tells us about the Israelites and the Philistines. They were getting ready to battle. And here we have David, the future king of Israel. And what he's doing is bringing food from home for his brothers. And when David's oldest brother saw him, he said, Why have you come down here? Then David got the same exact response to it to a certain extent when he later volunteered to fight Goliath. Saul said, You're not able to go out there. You're only a boy. However, despite any of that negativity, despite any of the criticism, David would not give up. And we know how that story ended, do we not? There was a man by the name of Robert Fulton. That may, name may not ring a bell for most of you in this room. But this man invented what we know as the steamboat. When he first presented his invention, he gathered a group down by the riverbank to show off what he was proud to show, this brand new invention. And the critics began to shout out loud, It'll never start! It'll never start. And Fulton, of course he proved them wrong. And then after all the clanking and the groaning of this particular invention firing up for the very first time here on the water, the critics, they were only quiet for just a moment or two. Because once it started uh, downhill, they started saying, it'll never stop. It'll never stop. And our critics will never stop. Trust me when I say this, we'll never be able to fully please everyone. As you are criticized, 
as those negative voices come into your life, follow the example of Bartimaeus. Follow the example of David. Even follow the example of David, uh, of Robert Fulton. Yes, listen. Grow from the criticisms that you receive. Grow from them. Move forward despite those things, but don't let them hold you back. Seize the opportunity that God is giving you and do not allow others' criticisms to govern your ambition. Never allow the criticism of others to govern your ambition. Now finally this morning, if we're to move from surviving to thriving, we must learn to exercise the faith available to us. Notice Bartimaeus' boldness as he grabbed Jesus' attention. His boldness and enthusiasm were almost impossible to miss. I don't want to make any mistake this morning about this story. It was not Bartimaeus' boldness that caused Jesus to stop and heal this man. Boldness was great, but it was his faith that triggered the response of Jesus Christ. And Jesus then said to blind Bartimaeus, No longer blind, your faith has healed you. However, Bartimaeus knew exactly what he wanted to do. He knew exactly what he wanted to do. And for that reason, he did not hesitate to speak to Jesus. Did you know that we have that same privilege? Look in your Bible now. Jeremiah 33 and verse 3 says, call to me, and I will answer you. I will tell you great and hidden things of which you do not know. So you have that privilege, just like Bartimaeus, to call out to God. Philippians 4 in verse 6 in the New Testament. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and by petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. But I want everybody in this room to be careful. I want us to be careful about requesting things from God. Now here's why. Speaking to God, requesting of God is great. But it's not enough. You see, we've got to be not like the rich young ruler and simply ask a question, yet remain unchanged. The truth is, we have got to grow. We have got to take the course that God has presented us and work it out. Because the truth is, complete faith is obedient faith. Mark tells us that when Bartimaeus got his sight, did he just go back home and relax? Did he go out and stand by the sea and watch the, the, the sunset? No, the story tells us that he followed Jesus along the road. Can you just imagine, brethren, what it was like for him to share that story with everyone along that road? Listen, I was blind for all these years and this man gave me my sight. What an amazing story and a testimony that must have been about how Jesus had changed his life. There was a missionary in a small village. He was not there to preach or teach. He was there to perform surgeries. Surgeries that the people in these small villages could not afford. And there was a man who was suffering with his eyesight. And he went before the surgeon. The surgeon did the surgery in a, in a great fashion. And now this man could see. And he's supposed to stay in this hospital for a few days and rest up and recuperate after the surgery. But one day they went in the room and he was gone. He had vanished. So they were worried about it. Days went by. A few days later there was a knock. At that 
missionary's door. And here stood this man whom he had performed surgery on, and he was holding a rope. Do you know what was on the other end of that rope? Ten other blind people. You see, genuine faith is contagious. Genuine faith in God exemplified by who we are and how we act and the words that we say, that's contagious faith. You can get fake anywhere. People do not come to churches to find fakes. They come to church to find real people and real relationships and real opportunities to serve God and to do something different from their life than they could do out in the world. And that, my friends, is how we grow a church by being genuine people, genuine faith, obedient to God. And when God presents opportunities, we act on them. I want everybody in this room to stop settling for less. I want everybody in this room to know this morning that if your life is in disarray, maybe you feel, like I've said, that your life is like those two trains headed towards one another. There's eventually going to be a crash, and it's going to be bad, and it's going to be awful. I want you to know that it's never too late. It's never too late for turning around. We have a church in here this morning to pray with you. If you've got a life this morning that's off track, we're here to pray with you. If you've got a life that's never been on track with Jesus, put him on in baptism today and start down that road of following him just like the once blind Bartimaeus had done. If we can help you this morning, come together.